24. I'm Mark Handrahan. Whitney is off tonight. New this afternoon, Spokane police confirmed they are now involved in the investigation into reports of suspected fraud involving a large amount of money in the city's housing and homeless system. City council members say they learned that a former employee of the Guardians Foundation was allegedly mishandling money. The claims prompted two council members to call for a criminal investigation into the fraud. They say the stolen funds range anywhere between 100000 and $1 million. Our Amanda Rowley spent the day tracking down more details on the situation today. She is joining us live in the studio tonight to share what is happening right now with the case. Amanda? Well, Mark, this really is a complex situation, but here's what we know so far. The Spokane Police Department told me this afternoon there is, in fact, an open investigation into the Guardians Foundation. In fact, just today, SPD assigned a detective to look into the allegations of theft and embezzlement within the organization. That means city council members who were calling for a criminal investigation got what they wanted. We also know right now the mayor's office is conducting an internal audit. That's because the city awarded millions of taxpayer dollars to the Guardians to operate shelters in the city. But who are the Guardians? Well, I'll explain. The Guardians Foundation became a tax exempt nonprofit in 2011. Its CEO, Mike Shaw, founded the organization with the intent to help veterans. The Guardians Foundation website says it maintains multiple facilities that house at-risk veterans and their families in Washington, Idaho, Oregon, and Utah. In May 2020, the Guardians Foundation took over operations at the Cannon Street Center in Spokane. Then, in September last year, the city of Spokane awarded the Guardians a $1.85 million contract to operate the Cannon Street Center as a year-round shelter. In August this year, City Council approved a $2.4 million agreement with the Guardians to run the new Trent Avenue shelter. We searched the nonprofit's status with the Washington Secretary of State's office. It lists their business status as delinquent. And in a search on GuideStar, a website that monitors nonprofits, it says the organization's tax exemption status was automatically revoked for failure to file required tax forms for three consecutive years. Still, the Guardians remain the operator for the city's Cannon Street and Trent Avenue shelters. All right, Amanda, there's still a lot of unanswered questions Great. surrounding the alleged fraud. So what can you tell us about that? Yeah, a lot, right? So SPD says it does not have a formal police report filed on this. Mm -hmm. And even though we learned from the Guardian CEO, Mike Shaw, he says he reported to police. Now, SPD says it only has a crime check call that mm -hmm. came in on September 29th from someone affiliated with with the Guardians. Right. All right, what about the details of the fraud itself? Well, we still don't know the identity of the former employee accused of fraud or how much money was actually taken and put into their personal account. Now, city council claims it could range from 100,000 to as much as a million dollars. So our hope was to get those details from that police report. But again, we, we still need to get that information. So since there is no record of a police report, we've pressed the mayor's mm -hmm. office, we've pressed the city and the Guardian CEO, Mike Shaw, for more information. But at this time, they haven't responded. Yeah, last question. Is there any sort of timeline and when we could learn more about this? Yes. Yeah, so the next thing to be looking for, Council Member Michael Cathcart says there is a forensic audit that is currently underway and it is expected to conclude October 31st. That's when we expect to learn something more about this alleged fraud. All right, we'll certainly keep tabs on it, Amanda. Thank you very yeah. much. All right, in other news this afternoon, we are learning more about a wrong way crash in Arizona that killed two teenagers from Clarkston. New aerial video shows the damage that was done by that wrong way driver. 18 year olds Ariana Huffman and Maggie Ogden were both students at Grand Canyon University. Investigators say a driver going the wrong way on I-17 near River, Arizona caused the crash. Hoffman was studying marketing and advertising. Ogden was a pre-med student studying biology. The suspect driving the wrong way survived the crash and was taken to the hospital. Investigators are now looking into if that driver was impaired at the time of the crash. And just hours ago, the 18-year-old man accused of attacking and raping a woman in downtown Spokane faced a judge for the first time. Ethan Jake is accused of assaulting a 51-year-old woman who was out walking her dog at around 1 o'clock in the morning near 1st and Division earlier this month. According to court documents, Jake followed her, punched her in the face, tackled her to the ground, and raped her. Jake pleaded not guilty in court to rape charges. His bail was set at $100,000. 
And an early morning dumpster fire damaged the outside of O'Doherty's Irish Grill this morning. Spokane firefighters were called to the fire at West Spokane Falls Boulevard and North Stephen Street at around 530 this morning. That fire spread to the outside of the building. The flames, though, were quickly put out before any major damage happened. It is still not known what started that fire. And new at 4 today, we are learning more about a platform collapse at the University of Idaho Fraternity House that sent four people to the hospital. Now U of I's Phi Kappa Tau chapter is in some hot water for building the platform. Abby Davis with our sister station spoke with a student who was at the party on Saturday about the moments leading up to the collapse. Saturday night didn't turn out like University of Idaho Junior on a East Herb planned. It was just really just chaotic all at once because no one was really expecting it to happen. What happened? A raised platform collapsed, injuring four people. It was built by U of I Phi Kappa Tau fraternity members. It's like an every year tradition that they have. Here's what they built in 2017. You can climb up like using like a, a structure they build kind of to climb up onto it. It's like a little lookout area, basically. I think people just kept climbing up when pe when everyone was trying to get them to come down and it was just at max capacity. And people were trying to get them down because they yes. recognized that there were too many people on there. Because I went up there because I thought, you know, I wanted to see what it looked like. It looked fine. And they immediately kicked me off. And, there, and then once that happened, like five minutes after, it fell down and they were still trying to get people down. And that was fraternity brothers trying to regulate yeah. the situation. Probably just trying to have like some risk management. Moscow Volunteer Fire Chief Brian Nickerson says the platform that collapsed was six or seven feet tall. First responders arrived at the scene around 11.30 p.m. Herb says at least 30 people were standing on the platform when it collapsed. Some people were underneath. The men in the fraternity were trying to get everyone who wasn't um, injured or wasn't involved in it at all to leave property immediately and like get out of the situation so no one else got hurt and to see to get to the people who were injured. Nickerson told KTVB first responders took the four injured people to Gritman Medical Center. One person was later flown to another hospital nearby because of severe injuries. University administration say they are, quote, working with the injured students' parents and are trying to better understand the situation. I also reached out to U of I's Interfraternity Council and the Phi Kappa Tau fraternity, but did not hear back. As a member of the Greek community herself, Herb says she's hoping for better risk management in the future. When someone tells you something, it's probably for your safety, not because they're not trying to have you make you have fun. You know, that's definitely a lesson for a lot of people, I think, is um, making sure there are those extra safety steps and just having them in place and prepare for the worst almost. All right, let's talk weather now. Our beautiful fall continues with temperatures back in the 70s again today. Let's get over to meteorologist Michelle Boss in for Jeremy today. Michelle, this has been the warmest start to fall on record, right? Yeah, it, it probably has. I'm thinking that October will likely go down as a record warm month, maybe record dry month as well, as we haven't seen any measurable rain all month yet, and we're pretty much halfway through. But if you remember last week for last week's forecast, we can kind of uh, take that shape just a couple of degrees off and you will have this week's forecast. We're looking at high temperatures right now. Our temperatures uh, at four o'clock in the lower 70s right now in Spokane and Deer Park, a little bit cooler, upper 60s in Sandpoint and Pullman and mid 70s across central Washington from OMAC down to Moses Lake and Othello. It's also 74 in Lewiston, a little bit breezier of a day than we've seen in the past week that helped to clear out some of that haze in eastern Washington. Air quality has improved across much of the area. We were in the moderate category for much of last week and we are currently in the good category right now with an AQI of 46 but high pressure is building right back in and so I anticipate our air quality will start to deteriorate somewhat as we move on in the week and we'll find ourselves back in the moderate category. But otherwise, beautiful weather expected across the region. We've got mostly sunny skies out there right now and expect more of that this week. Clear skies overnight, temperatures dipping down a little bit cooler than last week. We'll be in the low to mid 40s, but high temperatures all week in the low to mid 70s. All right, sounds good, Michelle. Thank you very much. And still to come tonight on Creme 2 News at 4, the Coeur d'Alene City Council is hosting a six hour community meeting about a new housing development possibly coming to the city. More on that after the break.